Today, you are listening to Think Again Christian, where pop culture and Christian traditions collide with biblical truth. Sponsored by Rainier Christian Schools. And now your host, pastor of Ravensdale Bible Church and superintendent of Rainier Christian Schools, Tony Jamie. Rethinking and re-examining concepts, ideas, traditions, and challenging your beliefs from American pop culture and your Christian denominational circles. How? Well, by the renewing of your mind through God's Word and open radio conversation. Well, have you ever heard of Lego Man? No, no, I'm not talking about the Lego movies, although those were pretty good. Well, I'm sure most of you at one time or another have built a a person made from Legos, right? Or at least you pretended it was a person. I'm also sure you've heard of Cro-Magnum Man or Nebraska Man, Piltdown Man, who were supposed to be our our ancient ancestors. Well, I hope you've had a chance to watch the um, the specially you know released movie is Genesis History that was just released in a in a few um, uh, theaters for a, a very select amount of time. Well, this was produced by by the team that gave us a video series called The Truth Project, which was also a an excellent series. Well. Right now, it, it's, it's not an easy time to be a, a six-day creationist. For some time now, the, you know, the weight of con- conviction within the evangelical world has swung towards, towards views that demand a, an, an old earth position. Old earth meaning billions of years versus kind of the biblical creationist view of thousands of years. Right now, only 17 American seminaries teach a literal six-day creation, and, and that's including a lot of seminaries that have like, you know, 30 people in them. So it's, it's, it's slowly or, 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 or very quickly uh, on the decline. And so while few Christians are, are full-out theistic evolutionists, more and more believers are, are holding to the, the ancient universe position. And yet there's still some, and perhaps it's even a quiet majority, who, who take the, the creation account in a literal way, as I do. Over the past few years, we've, we've been given some interesting new research to, to bolster this view and, and to help reconcile it with what we, what we can observe in the world around us. Now, the, the movie attempts to deal with that in, in kind of one simple question— Is the biblical account of creation and the flood meant to be understood as actual history? In other words, does it describe actual factual? I like actual factual. It just gives it kind of an emphasis. Actual factual history. And does does the world give evidence of a recent creation and catastrophic flood? Well, yes, it does. If Genesis is history from the first chapter to the last, it is then designed to tell us what happened and and how it happened. And when we understand Genesis as actual factual history, then we can approach the world through its lens, and suddenly we see evidence all around us. We see the world backing up the the Genesis story with, with plenty of scientific evidence. I mean, how else would we, we get fossils of fish in mountains or dinosaur fossils right next to their footprints? That suggests an, an immediate, an immediate change, not a, a, a slow change over, over time that evolution demands. Now, in the movie, Is Genesis History? Mount St. Helens shows uh, how its, its eruption made an immediate, catastrophic change to to the mountain and the areas around it, the, the kind of changes that, that we would assume would take hundreds or thousands of years, not hours. And then it also bounced back. During my lifetime, when I was a kid, I remember the ashes coming down to California, uh, where, where I grew up, Southern California. And so again, the, the premise would be that if, if you were to just show up and see Mount St. Helens today, you would assume that this took millions of years to, to essentially, like a big old giant ice cream scooper, scoop out the mountain. And, and we know it didn't. Additionally, the Grand Canyon makes more sense if there was a, a global flood rather than this 
little tiny trickling river that somehow ripped through miles of rock layer. I mean, that, that again, doesn't make any sense. Now, could you imagine somebody walking into the average nine-year-old's bedroom and, and seeing a Legoland empire? There would be buildings, cars, planes, and, of course, Lego people. And if they use the simple hypothesis, as do modern uh, believers in evolution, they would assume that Lego Man and his world must have evolved over billions of years of time. Now, now let's be real. Who would take that scientist seriously? Nobody. So I have to go back to my, my fifth grade education, my, my, my fifth grade teacher, Mr. Lipnitsky of of Edison Elementary, the pride of Glendale, California. He used to give us these current event assignments, and and he taught us to look for who, what, when, where, why, and how in the event that we were were writing about. That was our assignment. So if I applied that same process to to Lego Man, I I would ask who made him, what is he, when was he made, where was he made, Why was he made, and how was he made? Now, our two main worldviews that we're looking at here are creation and evolution. And the Bible says, well, the answers to those questions for us is in the first chapter of Genesis. The who, God, the what, he created, the when, is in his beginning about 5,000 years ago. The where, he did it from from heaven. Why? For his good pleasure. It was good for God's glory, the chief end to all men, right? Your basic catechism. Well, what about Lego man? Well, who? People make Lego man. The what? Well, they make Lego man from Legos. When? Well, they've been making Lego man since the invention in 1949. So Lego man hasn't actually been around that long. And where would we be making Lego man? Well, in in our homes. And we make Lego man for our good pleasure, too. Now, now, if I were to apply the theory of evolution to Lego Man, I'd have to say that, well, that nobody made Lego Man. He didn't come from pieces of Legos, but he evolved from entirely something else. And Lego Man and his empire started billions of years ago out of space, because, of course, you couldn't instantaneously just have Lego Land Empire, right? So it had to have taken billions of years to create how somehow, out of random chance, there was this big bang, boom, and bingo, the origins of Lego Man occurred. And of course, this would happen out of absolutely nothing. Now, you, you may be laughing right now, but if you really think about it, this is what the evolutionists believe with all their heart. And, and oh yeah, I forgot. Somehow, Lego Man, like his cousin Pinocchio, becomes a living boy, too. Because remember, Lego Man isn't alive, but somehow he's going to be. I mean, does anybody believe that you could put a bunch of pieces of of giant, you know, or, 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 or a bunch of pieces of Legos into a giant baggie and then shake it for a few thousand or a few million times over a few thousand or a few millions of years and, and all of a sudden Lego Man would come out of it? Maybe, maybe you've heard the kind of the laundromat, you know, uh, analogy where... You know, you put in your clothes in the laundromat and somehow after it rolls and rolls and rolls and rolls and rolls around in time, it's going to come out perfectly pressed and folded for you. Well, then why would you believe that that could happen from from nothing and that that somehow, you know, Lego Man, you know, that nothing would turn into blocks that you can now see a Lego Man who could now see and hear and feel and smell, taste, breathe and reproduce life. Now, some of you say, well, you're just taking kind of a giant leap. And, and, and of course, in any illustration, you, you know, it's an illustration, so you could find um, errors in it. I, I, I agree. But, but you'll say I'm taking it too big of a leap, and that evolution of man didn't just jump from the Big Bang to humans, because that took billions of years. But what I'm saying is that if you applied the same theory of Lego man, then why can't Lego man become a human Someday. I mean, aren't we starting with more than what evolutionists are saying we started with with man? 
And so obviously he was just invented in 1949, but given another million years, he would evolve into something better. Wouldn't he? Well, I don't think so. And I don't think anybody would bet their life on it either. So let's go back to the who, what, when, where, why, and how idea. Is this good science? Well, just consider the steps of the scientific method. You know, first step, make an observation. Scientists are, are, are curious about the world, and so they're making observations. Two, form a, a question. You know, after you kind of make an interesting observation and the scientific mind has an itch to find out more, that, that's good. Three, form a, a hypothesis. Form an opinion. Lego man could become a human boy. Lego man came from nothing. Four, conduct an experiment. Well, okay, get put them in a baggie and shake, shake, shake and experiment on that. And then five, analyze the data and draw a conclusion. Well, I can apply the scientific method with Lego Man, and scientifically I can prove over and over again that creation requires a creator. And conversely, life never comes from non-life, so I can observe who made my Lego Man. My question is, could Lego Man evolve from pieces of Lego banging together in a bang? And if my hypothesis, I, I, I could conduct an experiment, and I have. I speak at chapels, and every time I speak in chapels and I kind of use this as an example, I have all the kids go around, and, and they all shake, 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 shake. And we've been shaking for a couple of years now, and nothing's happened. Well, after doing my, my test from my hypothesis, I can, I can analyze the data and draw our conclusions that Lego Man could not come from a bag of Legos, and most definitely could not come from a bag of Of nothing. Well, what now really sounds scientific is that Lego Man was created by an invention of a creator. I can then use the same method and say, well, what about the Lincoln Log Man? Or what about the Tinker Toy Man? See, it it, it works. You know, none of these guys are going to become human boys because they were all made by inventors who made these products by men, by they're creators. They're, that's all they are. They're just a created thing. Well, how do we get so far from this common sense or good journalism of the who, what, when, where, my, and how? And how is the scientific method still called, or, or how is it that the scientists still call evolution something real when it's still a theory? When we come back, we'll talk more about Lego Man. Since their small beginnings in 1963, the Ministry of Rainier Christian Schools has been dedicated to educating and developing each of their students for the glory of God. And it's more than just a school. Rainier Christian Schools is actually an entire school district, with three schools serving the areas of Kent, Auburn, Covington, Renton, and Maple Valley. The Christ-centered environment weaves God's truth through everything they do, from top-notch academics all the way through their competitive sports programs. Learn more at RainierCSD.org or call 425-255-7273. That's 425-255-7273. Contact Rainier Christian Schools today. Welcome back. You're listening to Think Again Christian, sponsored by Rainier Christian Schools. And now your host, Tony Jamie. Today we're talking about Lego Man. Well, really we're talking about the, the argument between creation, creationism, creationists, and evolution and those who believe in evolution. And so we're talking about Lego man and how really silly and unscientific I might add that it would be for for Lego man to become a real life human boy and we went through the who what when where why and how and we took a quick look at the scientific method and 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 we you know, we had our question about Lego Man, formed a hypothesis, conducted an experiment, analyzed the data, and the conclusion is that Lego Man could not become a human boy. Well, I can understand the unbelieving world maybe taking this position, but my bigger concern is with professing Christians. And, and there's a huge movement of theistic evolution that is sweeping through our Christian college campuses and churches that believe God was the one who created evolution. Well, what does Scripture say about that? And, and the Bible addresses uh, the, 
the origin of mankind in, in the first pages, in, in, in the opening remarks. And remember, the, the first chapter of, of any book um, really looks to, to come out with a, with, with, with a, a, a strong uh, attention grabber, right? And the Bible is no different. It, it does that. And make no mistake, beginning with creation is intentional by the Lord. And this is God's book, and he's addressing the big questions in life right out of the gate. Who am I and where did I come from? So Genesis 1 states, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. There was nothing there before God. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, he spoke into existence, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning one day. Now, you want to talk about the who, what, when, where, why, and how? It's all right there. The Bible completely supports not only that God is creator of the universe and not a Big Bang, but he instantly spoke into existence creeping things and birds and mankind. There is no room for theistic evolution. That is unless you change the words or change the meaning of the words. And well, that's exactly what's being attempted, especially with the word day. And so day is somehow now not one day, not one 24-hour period, but day must mean something else. Well, where do we get this idea? Well, the, I think the speculation comes from uh, kind of a, a, a taking out of context from Second Peter 3, ta- 3, 3 nine mentions that to the Lord, a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So that must mean that in, in somehow in Genesis 1, that maybe one day even means a million. But see, this passage is clearly a simile, comparing the patience of God to a thousand years of time, meaning that God's patience, God's patience, it's, it's like only one day to him. He, he's so patient, it's like a thousand days. It has nothing to do with a literal uh, time period. Now, unlike Genesis 1, 2 Peter is not the literal grammatical historical of, account of a day that we do see in Genesis 1, where the Hebrew word yom is used. And in fact, yom is defined as a one-day, 24-hour period, actually beginning at nighttime. And, and, and that's because of Genesis 1. I mean, you just ask any religious Jew why they celebrate Sabbath when the sun goes down, because that's the beginning of the day, and, and this is taken out of the context of Genesis 1. And so this is why it's so important to have proper context when reading and studying the Bible, because we don't want to pull from, from a simile or an illustration, Second Peter, to then somehow put it into a, a, a literal meaning in Genesis 1. Well, Romans 1, 19, 20 gives us another kind of perspective of, of, of creation. And for since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen. Why? So that you're without excuse. See, God expects his creation to be evident, so evident within man's common sense, within his, what he can see with his, his own eyes. Creation then is self-evident, according to the Lord, so that and to the extent that, that all mankind is held accountable. You're held accountable for your belief or unbelief because of what you see. This is why the idea of the, the man in the, in the island or the village who has never you know, seen TV or heard the name of Jesus, he's supposed to be able to look up in the stars in the sky and see the sun say, not worship the sun, as many did, but then say, who created the sun? Something's bigger, something's better out there, who brings the rain down, who gives me life, who sprouts my vegetation, and that's who I give glory and honor to. So when we talk to our students at Rainier Christian Schools, I mean, we, we get all kinds of view, views on this. And, well, usually the kids believe what their, what their parents believe. But all around them, they're being told every day that there's this theory of evolution, and that's what's self-evident. That's what's, what's so obvious. And you're a fool if you think that, that, you know, we could send a man to the moon and, 
and get evolution wrong, well, that's just a giant logical fallacy. And, and just because we can, you know, scientifically send people to the moon, that doesn't mean that they get everything right in science. I mean, just read a science book from 10 years ago and 20 years ago and 30 years ago. They're completely changing it every 10 years. Well, one of my best friends uh, taught me three rules of fraud. Um, yes, I do believe evolution's a fraud, by the way. But three rules of fraud, big conclusions, little evidence, failure to disclose key material facts, and diversion. Well, the other day I had the opportunity to share this in one of our Bible classes and uh, as part of our open discussion. So we use this method of fraud detection to, to, to evaluate uh, evolution. And so first, big conclusions with little, little evidence. Well, I can't think of any bigger conclusion than the Big Bang Theory. There's zero evidence for it. Nobody was there, and there'll never be a way to prove it, and they've never been to repeat that in a scientific lab. So there's zero evidence, and there never will be, and yet there's 110% conviction. Zero evidence times whatever equals 110% conviction. Now, if that's not faith, I don't know what faith is. And I wholeheartedly admit that I believe in the Bible by faith, that I believe in God by faith, and that his creation then is by faith. But I I, I can draw a conclusion that created things are being created by creators because of everything else I see around me. When I see a computer, it was created. When I see a car, it was created. When I see glasses, they were created. Everything I see around me has a creator. But a the, heart, the, the scientists seem to think that their big conclusion is somehow some great science instead of pure faith. It's just a big conclusion with little to no evidence. Second, we see a failure to disclose key material facts, a, a failure to be completely honest. It's the idea that when they're presenting the evidence, they withhold the pieces of truth that don't work for them. It's another way of saying that essentially there's no proof to convict. Well, this has failed the scientific method test. Evolution has failed the scientific method test. That's why it's still called the theory of evolution. And there are no proven transitional forms that, mu- that must exist for evolution to work. So secular schools fail to disclose that evolution is really just an unproven theory that's been unproven for year after year after year, that it never has a transitional form, form after form after form, that their greatest pillars have been proven to be wrong, Nebraska man, Pilt Dan man, Darwin's origin of species refuted over and over again by, by evolutionists and scientists, carbon dating's wrong all the time, and so on. And so why hold on to an un- unproven theory so tightly? Well, because the alternative leads to creation and then a creator that you're accountable to. The third one is diversion. And so like any good con man or magician, you divert people's attention from the key material facts and focus then on, on minutia and, and, and more grand claims of big conclusions with, with no evidence. So when we put evolution on the scientific microscope, our, our students can see the, the lies, the myths, the bad logic, and, and the problems that, that evolution possesses. And this is one of the reasons why we believe only a Christian education is a great one because we actually test the spirits. We actually, in good academia, look at both sides. And so I wish Lego Man was funny, but, but it really isn't. And so when we go back, read Genesis 1 and think about how important it is that you get it right. If you don't really believe in Genesis 1 and its historical account, then how can you believe in Genesis 3 when the devil is introduced? How can you believe in Genesis 6 when no and the flood happens? Why would Genesis 12 and the promises to Abraham be important? Could you believe in the saving grace that God provides to Adam, Eve, Cain, Noah, A- and Abraham's families? See, Genesis 1 and creation is absolutely essential to the Christian faith. And so before you think that evolution could be real, think about Lego Man. And think again, Christian. You've been listening to Think Again, Christian, sponsored by Rainier Christian Schools and Tony Jamie. Rainier Christian Schools serves preschool through high school with three locations in the Renton, Maple Valley, Covington, Kent, and Auburn areas. For more information about Rainier Christian Schools, 
www.rainiercsd.org or call 425-255-7273.